Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope you all are surviving the uh, smoldering, smoky uh, environment in Montana. As someone in living in Oregon, I apologize that our state is uh, polluting your air quality with our big fire here. Okay, uh, Tristan, do you do things look okay from your end? Yep, everything is up and ready to go. Okay. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Eric Steve Otter. I was sitting in on the previous uh, session that you all participated in. Uh, I'm with the Region 17 Comprehensive Center based in Portland, Oregon. Um, we are a um, project funded by the federal government, the Department of Education, to provide support to state education agencies. We're happy to be working with OPI and with ISTE in Idaho uh, to support them and help them build their capacity to uh, do good work on behalf of the students of their state. So um, normally I'd be partnered with Crystal Andrews, um, who is head of licensure at OPI, but she was called away for an urgent um, family matter. So uh, myself and Tristan Belknap of OPI are joining you today. And uh, we're happy to share with you some updates that the Chapter 57 Task Force has been working on. So just kind of looking at the Zoom panel, uh, I see it looks like we'll have kind of a smallish group. So that's great. We'll have lots of opportunity for all of you to provide input. I know maybe not all of you were on the last session that we had back in June. Um, so Tristan and I would just like to do a quick roll call and maybe we can also do some introductions as well. I do see a couple of familiar names and faces, um, but I also see a couple that might be new or maybe I'm just not remembering. Um, so for purposes of both introductions and also a roll call as this is a public meeting, um, I'm wondering if each of you would be willing to introduce yourselves briefly. Um, so as I look on my panel, I see Christine Steinberg. You want to say a quick hello? Good morning. My name is Christy Steinberg, and I'm the licensure and assessment manager in the College of Education at the University of Montana. So I've been in this role about 13 years. So I deal with licensing for our P-12 um, completers um, at UM, and I also work on our accreditation team. And lastly, but probably most importantly, I'm also the parent of a incoming sixth grader. Great. Thank you, Christy. Okay, uh, next on my screen is Michelle Payne. Hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Payne, and I'm currently the principal at Flathead High School in Kalispell. Uh, this will be my fifth year as principal. Served a number of roles in the Kalispell School District and excited to be here today. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, next, I see Carrie Cobb. Hello, I'm Carrie Cobb, and I have been with Bozeman School Districts for the last 15 years. I'm at Gallatin High School as a librarian, and I have also taught business and computer science. Okay, thank you. Um, next, I see on my list, Noelle Harper. Hi, I'm Noelle. Um, I'm a librarian at Gallatin High School in Bozeman as well. Um, I've been in the district for two years and have also taught um, previously in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've taught a studio art um, as well. So thank you, I'm excited to be here. Great. Um, next I see on my list, Shelly White, or wait, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Yep, Shelly White. I'm the 712 principal at Forsyth and this will be my ninth year here. Great. Thank you. Next, I see Dennis Girk. Yeah, my name is Dennis Girky. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I've been in public education in Montana for 36 years, 20 as a superintendent, 16 as a teacher. I'm currently the superintendent at Rapple J School. Any of you uh, know where Rapple J School is? Uh, and I'm happy to be on the committee and uh, listen to everybody's input. Great. Thank you, Dennis. You bet. Uh, next, I see Tim Norbeck. Yeah, hello, I'm Tim Norbeck. I'm the superintendent of Jefferson High School in Boulder, Montana, entering my ninth year. Uh, 19th year as an administrator and 34 years uh, total in education. So glad to be on the panel as well and see if we can provide some insight to uh, licensure that may you know, help make it more smooth. Great, thank you, Tim. And then finally, I see on my list, uh, Shay Kidd. Shay Kidd, I teach at the University of Montana Western and I teach education and math. I also teach online with Idaho's online school, Idaho Digital Learning, and I've been doing that for 10 years now, teaching college for four years now. Great. Thank you, Shay. And I think that's all I see on my list. Uh, it's possible people may pop in later, but thank you very much for introducing yourselves. And thank you very much for making time for this. Um, there's lots of interest in looking at education licensure in Montana. In fact, so much interest. Um, we actually have these two groups. So uh, just as kind of a quick reminder, there's a main task force that meets uh, every week and is doing a deep dive into the administrative rules of Montana, specifically chapter 57, uh, which deals with licensure. There's also a second task force that meets weekly to discuss uh, chapter 58, um, which deals with the accreditation of educator preparation programs in Montana. It's possible some of you maybe are participating in that task force. Um, so there's two task force that are doing the deep dive into the arms, but there's also uh, feedback groups, and this is the one for chapter 57. Um, really, it was just a matter of trying to keep a task force manageable. Um, OPI did the recruitment of folks. Um, so we knew since there was so much interest, we wanted to give other folks a chance to hear what the task force is working on, give feedback, give input. Um, so what we would like to do today, and I will get a presentation going here. Okay, so we did our introductions. So um, we'd like to share with you what the Chapter 57 Task Force has been discussing and working on and um, some resolutions that they have come to or that are emerging and get your any feedback you have on that um, on choices or decisions they've made uh, and then for upcoming discussions of the task force get additional insight from all of you that you want to make sure that the task force considers and then uh, we'll just kind of quickly review the schedules for both of the groups and then we'll have a brief closing. So are there any, we're, I think we're a small enough group so we can probably be a little more informal um, than we might be if the group was a bit larger. Are there any questions before we get started? Please use the uh, raise hand feature of Zoom to let me know at any point. And while we're talking about that, just a few quick reminders about Zoom and some of our norms around that. Uh, please feel free to use the chats to engage in conversations. Tristan and I will monitor that and um, call out comments or recognize people for their contributions. Uh, as I said, raise your hand electronically if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. And um, I think everyone's name is showing correctly, but if not, uh, on your Zoom screen, there should be an option with uh, three dots in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to make sure that your on-screen name matches your actual name, which will make it easier for us to keep track of folks. 
Uh, also, I see cameras are off. So that's totally fine. Um, if you feel that your internet connection is uh, a little shaky, feel free to turn off the camera in hopes of preserving that connection. Uh, also, just as a reminder, especially if you connected in late, the session is being recorded. Uh, this is a public meeting. Um, so this is accessible to all Montanans. Um, and just be aware of that and um, consider that as you think about and share your ideas and suggestions. So I didn't see any hands go up when I asked if there were any questions. So we'll go ahead and proceed. So there are really um, two areas or buckets of work that the T Chapter 57 Task Force has been working on. The very first, uh, and we shared this with this group back in June, was taking a look at the counselor to administrator pathway in Montana. The second piece of work that we'll get to later is um, taking a look at various issues related to what we're calling reciprocity, but really is about any friction in the licensure system for both in-state and out-of-state prepared educators, any friction that might be slowing down or burdening them to achieve licensure. And there's several issues wrapped up in that um, and we'll, we're happy to have, and we're planning to have a discussion on that a, a little bit later today. And so that we can capture any input any of you have for the task force to consider. So two main topics, counselor to administrator pathway and reciprocity have been the active discussions on the task force. Uh, the task force is very deliberative. So uh, we'll take a look at their schedule towards the end. It takes a while to talk through all the issues, as you might imagine, um, and there's all sorts of ripple effects. So, uh, but these are the two, two big topics, so we'll take them in turn. So beginning with the counselor to administrator pathway, a core question that the task force considered was, should a pathway to, admit to Montana administrative licensure for school counselors be reopened? And the reason the re is there is um, folks with a little more experience shared with us uh, that there was a pathway, there was such a pathway for a school counselor to become an administrator in Montana. Um, but in, it was either 2015 or 2017, some of you that have been in the system a bit longer can probably give us the correct year, um, but that pathway was closed. So there's been interest and some work by advocates and from uh, higher, the higher ed community in Montana to reopen that pathway. Um, and as this group discussed a bit back in June, there are suggestions or there was discussion about how school counselors are prepared uh, the role they currently play in schools, their role in teaching students and holding classes, and the way in which they are evaluated, and the ways in which that mirrors how teachers are evaluated, and how that evaluation experience equips school counselors to serve in a supervisory capacity over teachers, which was one of the sticking points. Um, and one of the things that required a lot of discussion and thought um, by the task force. And actually several of you, I, I think, spoke to that very well last month as well. So based on the input the task force had, they, they took a vote and decided in general, in principle, to reopen that pathway for school counselors. Um, and then from that vote, they decided to also recommend some specific changes to the administrative rules of Montana. So just to show you what that looks like, um, it's not a huge change. You can see what they propose to change in the arm is just really the text in red at the top of the slide there. There was some discussion about whether to change other items 
in section B of this particular arm. Um, but in the end, they kept it minimal and just changed the language here to indicate that in addition to teaching experience, school counseling experience would count towards the and would be acceptable for administrative licensure. So I'll just kind of go through a couple more slides here real quick and then we can pause and have a discussion or see if there's any questions. So on the next slide that just this just uh, finishes that previous arm. So as you can see there's no other changes. But then as is often the case in the arm there are ripple effects and there are different types of administrative licensure. So uh, as often happens with rule revision, you have to make sure you're keeping track of uh, other changes that are related to the main change. So just summarizing changes that would be made to other arms or other sections of the arm and other sets of administrative licensure. So again, the changes are in red. So Eric, on the previous slide, that kind of reservations, that wasn't arm language, that was just notes. Maybe it was two back, right in there. Mm -hmm. Reservations about. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Is B just. Yes, that's part of the minutes from that meeting. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes, my apologies, I forgot to cut that out. So yes, the, the change is um, in that main arm, just that first part. Okay, so in summary, um, the task force voted to reopen this pathway and provided some language that would enable school counselors, if they meet the other requirements of licensure to be an administrator to receive that licensure. Um, the task force made these language suggestions uh, in terms of process, it will still have to go through OPI um, and their counsel to make sure that the language is uh, correct. And then it, this will be presented to the board of, well, it'll, it will be presented to the superintendent for consideration. She has the option to accept this uh, recommendation, change or decline it, um, but, if she decides to move forward with it, she will then present this to the Board of Public Education, probably at one of the meetings happening in the early fall. And then the Board of Education would vote on whether to approve this. Okay, are there any questions or comments about this? So, I just want to make sure I understand this goes for any counseling person to then move into administration, but we aren't looking yet at any additional requirements required in that yet. No. Um, nope. And there was the task force did discuss if they should take a particular course. Um, so the issue of teacher evaluation, for example, came up. So should counselors be required to take a specific course? And the, the, the agreement was that, yes, that's important, um, but it felt like it was getting a little too specific to actually put specific language into the arm. Mm -hmm. um, some higher ed contributors also noted that uh, supervision and evaluation is a part of the coursework um, in the administrator preparation program and people with counseling experience or with experience supervising counselors um, indicated that the counselor's evaluation experience is uh, similar to or in alignment with the with what uh, teachers experience using the same basic framework. Okay and just to I mean my I guess concern is thinking about 
uh, big schools, especially like a high school counselor who works to get kids off to college may not have the teaching experiences that like an elementary or middle school counselor would. And that would be one of the key indicators that I would want an administrator to have. And so I, that's just one possible gap I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. So school counseling, I guess for me thinking, could we say something and they have to have done some teaching aspect in there um, and just showing that evidence, I think that'd be helpful to OPI to be able to see, yep, you've been in a classroom, you've had to actually talk with parents a lot, um, not just in getting your kids out of the K-12 schools and on to college, but where are they at in dealing with social issues or whatever that might be counselors having some level of experience with that but i know we don't have tons of big schools where a counselor does nothing but send them off to college but right. yes michelle you have your hand up would you like to speak yep. no i just would like to um toss in there the the courses required for the admin license include one three credit class on curriculum at least that was the case when I um, when I went through and which for someone like me like I had my master's degree already in curriculum right and I had taught previously so it wasn't that big of a deal but I guess I'm thinking about the counselor the school counselor who for whom then all of their curriculum knowledge you know, supposedly or per se could come just from that one three credit class. And I, my question is, is that adequate for then that person to be hired as a principal or as an admin somewhere and evaluate and um, support instructional programs, plan schedules, you know, all of the things that go around curriculum. So just a question. Anyone have thoughts on that? I will say to, to Shay's point, um, the task force did talk quite a bit about, um, particularly in smaller districts where many staff, not just counselors, but other people wear many hats and how the counselor is often sitting in for the principal when he or she is away and participating in some aspects of administration that other staff are not. Um, so yes, lots of nuance within this. So question, cause back to Michelle's point about, um, and maybe it's just not on this slide or I'm not seeing it, but for their uh, educational certification, what degree is required? Could I have a master's degree in counseling and use that to become an administrator? Yes, that's how it is. So they have their requirement to receive their uh, class six school counseling license, and it is a master's degree mm -hmm. uh, approved by a, a national accrediting body. Right. Um, and then a certain number of uh, experience hours. Um, so that's that's the preparation they would come in with, or that's what that's the preparation that uh, positions them to apply for and get the class six school counseling license. And um, you know, we should also point out, you know, this this opens a pathway. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that a school counselor who has been prepared in this administrator will get a specific job. That choice, that personnel decision is still up to the district that is considering them. So it's an, entirely possible that a district might say, you know, you for this particular candidate, we don't feel you quite yet, based on the other factors we're looking at, have what we're looking for for this specific position. So just because the pathway is open doesn't guarantee that um, every school counselor that receives the administrative licensure will be placed or hired by every position or in every position that they might consider or apply for. 
Mm -hmm. Shay, I don't know if you're asking. The next part of the language is that you have to complete an administrative prep program for principals. Okay. Yeah. And that's because. Yeah. So you would not have to do a full master's degree necessarily in educational leadership, like at UM and MSU and Rocky. I mean, we have pathways for the master's if you don't already have one, but then we have those for people like Michelle described, she already had her master's in curriculum instruction. Then you come back and do the principal licensure program. So that continues on as B, C, D in each of these rules. Okay, perfect. That, that answers my question. So you still have to do more. <laughs> yes, and we can pull up the arm if it's helpful uh, to look at. And my apologies that we had some task force notes instead of what I thought were the was the arm language. But yes, all other the counselor still has to pass all the other requirements that are required uh, for the administrative licensure. Thank you. Uh, Tristan just posted the link to the arms if you want to take a closer look. Okay, other questions about this pathway and proposed language changes. Again, as, as we noted, there's intermediary steps, OPIs, council will review the language, the superintendent will review the recommendation. Uh, it's ultimately her choice whether to present this to the board uh, as proposed or with changes. And then it's ultimately up to the board to vote to make this uh, the law of the land, so to speak. And this, so this would come up before the Board of Public Ed, most likely uh, in the fall. So we're talking like September, October, November. And as part of the board's process, there are there will be public hearings. So all that's to say that there's still opportunities for the public and for any of you to participate in the discussion around that. So um, there, correct me if I get the details wrong, Tristan, but there, the board will uh, present something that they'll potentially be voting on and there'll be a public comment period uh, before they'll take a final vote. So this is not the last bite of the apple, so to speak. So there's still opportunity for public input on this. Yeah, that's right, Eric. There's opportunity for public comment at the beginning and end of each uh, action meeting that the board has. And there's three for each like action decision like this. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this recommendation of the task force? Okay. So that took up several meetings of the task force. Um, and just like you, they, they discovered and discussed all sorts of nuances of this. In the end, they felt on balance that this pathway was uh, worth reinstating with the caveats that the counselors have to meet all other requirements and that, again, it's ultimately up to the hiring district to consider all the factors that go into whether they will consider um, someone prepared through this pathway as the right fit for their district or their schools. So, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, the task force then moved into um, discussions around what we're calling reciprocity, but um, can mean different things in different conversations. So just to pause and define our terms. Okay. Oh, and thank you, Tristan. Tristan just... Uh, noted when the next Board of Public Ed meeting will be. So, so reciprocity can mean, um, it can mean something called full reciprocity, which is where if you have a license, an educator license, a valid educator license in one state, 
you're automatically or almost automatically considered and issued an equivalent license in another state with minimal review. Um, this is something that Montana has participated in in the past, but does not currently. Um, Montana is part of an interstate agreement, um, but does not currently have any memoranda of understanding with other states to enable this full reciprocity. Um, as you can see on the slide there, there were some interstate agreements with Idaho, South Dakota, and Utah for that type of full reciprocity. Um, but by 2002, any such agreements were ended. There were concerns around lax standards for teacher quality. And um, since that time, Montana has not pursued that specific type of full reciprocity. We at the Comp Center worked with some OPI counterparts to take a look at uh, different aspects of what we are also calling reciprocity, but in which case we mean the ability of an educator with a license and experience from another state to receive an equivalent licensure in Montana. Montana does review licensure applications. Uh, so what we and OPI were interested in looking at was, are there places where the licensure system may ask or make different demands of out-of-state applicants compared to in-state applicants? And are those requirements and fair? Well, are they fair for in-state prepared applicants and in-state uh, licensure applicants, and are they fair for out-of-state applicants? We know there's a lot of teacher or educator mobility. Um, there are teachers and administrators and specialists that are moving between the states at all times. So this is uh, an area of interest generally at any time, but becomes a little more acute in Montana and other states as well. Uh, in times of educator shortages. And so we do know that there are shortages in Montana, at least within certain topic areas or specialty areas. Uh, we do know it's also challenging, and, and perhaps some of you know directly, it, it can also be challenging for more rural districts or more high needs districts to recruit educators. So the ability to uh, understand if there's any if there are any barriers in the system to either in-state applicants or out-of-state applicants, any barriers that prevent a, an effective teacher from working in a Montana classroom. We'd like to see if there, or OPI would like to see if there are opportunities to address those. And that might include seeing if there are changes that could be made to chapter 57 to ease any friction uh, for candidates, if there are any, if there's anything in the licensure system that might be causing undue burden or uh, unfair or inequitable demands of out of state versus in state uh, applicants who are equally positioned and equally qualified to teach. So that's. Uh, the version of reciprocity that the task force is examining. The task force has not uh, been interested, or at least so far has not seemed interested in exploring uh, full reciprocity, which is that idea of instant licensure or basically instant licensure if you have an equivalent license in another state. So, oops. Um, there is a report and we have a link to it here in our slides and we can make sure that it is in uh, the materials, online materials that you can download. Um, or maybe we can even put a link to it right now, Tristan, in the chat. And this was a, a summary report that the Comp Center prepared with, in collaboration with a couple of OPI staff. Uh, that took a look at um, some summary information about reciprocity 
in Montana and then also included some discussion and some case studies of issues where some out-of-state applicants encountered challenges in the licensure process when they sought to obtain licensure in Montana. So uh, you can definitely review the report. It's not meant to be exhaustive. It's just meant to highlight potential areas of concern. But based on that high level research, the task force is taking a look and doing a deeper dive into several areas. And we will have a chance to take a look at those in a bit. So some possible changes that came out and are highlighted in that report are taking a look at recency requirements. So how far in the past someone's teaching or administrative experience has been and finding shorter pathways to achieving um, or demonstrating competency in particular areas. So another opportunity is looking at years of experience and evidence of effectiveness. Uh, there may be opportunity to expand licensure eligibility for candidates with advanced credentials, such as PhDs. Uh, there may be opportunity to treat traditional and alternative educator preparation more equally for licensure purposes. So alternative educator preparation can, can look very different um, and can mean different things. And it could also include some innovative programs that some of our Montana higher ed in institutions are considering as well, or might be considering. And then another opportunity might be to um, revise or allow flexibility or kind of line up endorsement areas between states. So if States around Montana have certain endorsements for middle school that is 612. I'm kind of just making this up, but Montana maybe has it as 812 or um, defines middle school the endorsement differently than other states do. Sometimes that might trip up some applicants um, to, from getting the you know, specific endorsement that they're that they would like to have. So kind of getting into the details of endorsements. And then also taking a look at the use of emergency authorizations of employment. Uh, the use of that has expanded, we learned from OPI staff over the past year or two. Um, there's some concern that people who are so authorized might get stuck or might choose to stay in that annual renewal or that it might be tempting for districts to keep that process rather than moving people towards full licensure. So there's consideration there as well. So based on this report, the task force has divided itself up into subcommittees. And you can see those listed here, the top level bullets. So there is a subcommittee that's looking at coursework, one that's looking at experience, one that's looking at assessments, one that's looking at special reciprocity for uh, applicants with advanced credentials, special reciprocity for military spouses, and then uh, taking a look at alternative pathways. As noted, the other task force that's looking at ARM chapter 58 is also taking a look at this and discussing this. Uh, they've talked about the idea of a, of a year long uh, in-service, student teaching in-service experience for applicants. Uh, they're also 
discussing innovation, maybe uh, Christine or others who work for a higher ed institution can share some of some some of that innovative thinking the institutions within Montana are applying to uh, find efficient and creative pathways to get people into the teaching workforce. And then finally, a subcommittee is taking a look at the issue of endorsements. So we, the task force has just got, gotten started down this path. Um, last Thursday, we discussed the first two in detail, the coursework and the experience requirement. Uh, there is a requirement for applicants, certain out-of-state applicants to complete six credit hours of academic coursework before they can get their provisional license. So that subcommittee was interested in looking at alternatives. Um, could those credit, do those have to be six academic credit hours? Could they be a certain number of hours taking the courses offered on the teacher learning hub that OPI sponsors? Those courses are free. Um, and again, higher education folks suggested, well, perhaps um, institutions in Montana could also participate in that conversation and you know come up with some sort of shorter pathway or uh, something that doesn't require a person to get to enroll in and complete six full credit hours? Is there a, a different way that institutions could help people meet that requirement in new and creative ways? There is also mo consistently the, in the arms, um, there is a requirement of three years of experience. You'll see that all through the arms. Uh, there is one exception to that, and that is for, and I, I see some hands coming up there, so I'll just briefly summarize um, the discussion from the task force on this one item, and then we'll, we'll pause. Um, the, so an out-of-state applicant who comes from an alternative preparation program has to have five years of experience. And so there was this, some discussion about whether that is fair uh, and if that should potentially be changed to three years to make it consistent with the other experience requirements in the arms for other applicants. And really, that's about as far as the discussion got. The task force has not come up with any concrete recommendations yet. Um, and so the field is wide open, so to speak. And this is what the group will be working on. So what we thought we would do with you all today is discuss some of these things and get some of your thoughts and concerns and ideas around each of those um, potential areas of focus that might yield opportunities to streamline licensure for both in-state and out-of-state applicants. Um, so we think we'll, we'd like to invite all of you to discuss that for a bit. And maybe this is where you were going, but um, maybe not. Uh, Christine, you had your hand up. Or Christy, sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, I was just clarifying, you stated that people needed six semester credits. That's only if they don't have a current out of state license, correct? Yes, that is correct. So that's not every applicant coming oh. in. It's just if you have a lapsed license or don't have an active license. Yes, that, that kicks in. Okay. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. That. That's important. <laughs> Uh, Dennis, you had your hand up as well. Yes, um, thanks, Eric. A couple things that crossed my mind that would um, make things a little bit easier and open up the applicant pool a little more was, you know, they put in uh, here, I don't know how long ago it was, Eric, this uh, pre-K endorsement, which um, requires the person to have a pre-K endorsement. Um, 
the way it was before, you could just have that double zero endorsement in elementary and teach. Why not just let those teachers that have that double zero endorsement at elementary still teach pre-K? I mean, a lot of them are kindergarten teachers. So the struggle we had or schools had that had pre-K programs, they had to have their uh, teachers go back and get one and it entailed quite a bit. And so that limited uh, the folks we could find. So that might be a suggestion to just let those folks with the double zero endorsement teach pre-K. Um, the second idea that I thought of was allowing teachers to teach in their minor area. Way back when uh, we had minors, uh, for example, I have a uh, PE and health major, all right, and then I have a um, endorsement, uh, a minor in uh, science. So allow those people to teach in their subject area with their minor certification. Those were the two things uh, that I was thinking about, uh, Eric. Okay. Great. Thank you. And we can definitely bring those two observations and suggestions to the task force and the subcommittee working on endorsements. They have not uh, presented yet. So your suggestions are timely. I'm wondering if Dennis can elaborate a little bit because we do allow licensure programs at Montana institutions based on a major or a minor in the teaching subject area. So there are still pathways through minors. Um, you just have to start with a major in one area and then you can add teaching majors or minors in other areas. Yeah, maybe I'm out of date a little bit, uh, Christine, but so teachers right now can teach in their minor area and be certified. If they pursued licensure in that area, yes. So we have people with like, an English major and a history minor, and they're licensed to teach both of those subject areas. So I'm, I'm, I'm wrong there. So. But there are specific requirements that institutions have to follow as to what makes something a teaching minor, and that takes us to 58, which are the PEP standards. Um, so there are some specific requirements for what that minor looks like. But yes, we still license people. I'm pretty sure all Montana institutions shake and speak to that we license people with minors and not just majors and, yep. and you don't have to take any extra classes christine if you're starting out going through a teacher prep program then the minors are not additional coursework if you came to me and said i have a business minor we at the montana institutions per peps have to look at you know, is it business education as opposed to business and what few classes would you take to, to change that? But in terms of generally speaking, yes, an academic minor becomes the foundation for a teaching endorsement. That makes sense. Okay. Okay, do you feel that that potentially addresses the gap you were seeing, Dennis, or are there have there been more recent experience you've observed, or a, a different nuance that might you might suggest would still recommend a, a closer look at that endorsement or set of endorsements? That clarifies it for me a lot more. Okay. Okay, Shay, you have your hand up. So this is one we've had several people come to Western um that opi has essentially said no to because they didn't have a montana college endorsing them um and so i'm, I'm not sure exactly where this would fall uh and that's just kind of the overall thing so we had i, I had a student in class just uh last semester taught 20 years in a different state but had to and this might be the coursework, take so many credits from us to be able to get that. And so I'm wondering exactly where does that fit if somebody knows a little bit more about that? I just, I know the general complaint, but I'm not sure how it fits in this framework. Uh, 
Did they add it via testing or something, Shay, in that other state? Do you know? No. Because my experience has been if they can document the five years of experience in that additional area that they've been granted. Well, you dropped out there at the end. Say that again. Um, my experience has been if they added it via a different way, but they can document like through an alternative way, but they can document five years of experience that goes back to the experience column here that they've been able to get that. Okay. So it might be that they didn't have the specific experience for five years. And so they defaulted then to the coursework requirement. I, you know, without knowing the specific yeah. situation, it's hard. That's the, the part well, that always gets in here is like some of these are so nuanced that, you know, how do you make rules other than just saying we accept everyone? How do you, you know, make rules that, that cover these situations? Yeah. Again, and it's not just a single individual. We've had 10 to 12 that I know of, and I'm not even the person who would get all of these. Um, where that's been an issue. And so they've gotten a, uh, a class five for the three years and are taking classes from us in our teacher prep program to be able to fill in those gaps. And so. Hmm. Okay. Are they taking content coursework or education coursework? Typically education coursework, but they aren't getting the full teaching endorsement. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm not sure exactly where to put it, because I, I would want to say coursework, but it's not all of that. So I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, and there is there is a mechanism for the board to consider exceptional cases, or basically if OPI denies a license for some, basically it's like an appeal process, but I think both OPI and the board are interested in seeing if there are ways, and this kind of gets to Christie's point, are there, I mean, you're always, you may always have exceptions and you can't necessarily predict the nuances of every single individual case, but can certain, if you're starting to see certain patterns or certain things occurring over and over, is there a way within the arm to maybe reduce that because it is burdensome on OPI and the board to take a look at those special cases. You may, you'll probably never eliminate that need entirely, but can you reduce uh, some situations where they're seeing common issues crop up? So I just wanna make sure I'm putting this in the right spot. Sounds like it's a little hard to know for sure. So these, does it speak more to experience or does, I don't know, would you have the experience subcommittee think about this or would you have the endorsement subcommittee think about this? I would say um, coursework might be the okay. best spot for it. Okay. And there might be the terminology of Montana specific coursework or Montana institution. Um, and that is one of the big holdups instead of, you know, so we have to service them in the university system, the higher ed, instead of being able to say, you know, um, University of Phoenix or Western Governors or whatever. And so we're creating a problem that we have to solve rather than that other people can solve with us. Okay. And, um, but you're saying it, you're often seeing it when it comes to endorsement areas or it's more general? It's pretty general because I've had okay. this with multiple uh, content areas that have dealt with the issue. Okay. Okay, Michelle? I would just add in there that um, we've experienced that over the years too, it seems like, right? There's um, this from the outside looking in perception of well you know to switch your license over you have to take all these classes and you have to um and, and i get it you you know you should be bound by an institution who then can verify and vouch for the fact that you um you know you've got the preparation um but i but i do 
I do agree that sometimes it seems like um, there's, there's, there's a lot of hoops that candidates have to jump through to get that switched over that often involves coursework. Okay. Okay. So another one, because specific to endorsements, we have, um, I think it's the broad field social sciences, and there's a broad field science one that do not translate well into other states. And so also people coming from other states, as we get people in our post back programs that were, you know, I was a biology education but because of where they're going, they're going to be teaching chemistry and geology and biology. They have to redo that. So some of that might just be some name aspects, but I know we are specific because of our needs. And so that's when the translating of what theirs can translate into and ours can translate into their too. Okay. Michelle? <laughs> yeah, we, that science and social studies uh, has been an interesting one from a hiring perspective. Um, you know, getting people from other states that is yes, specifically in science, they only have that one subject area. Oh, that's a bugger. That is absolutely a bugger. And I don't know, I, you know, I don't know what the solution could be there, um, you know, because you, I understand from Montana's perspective, you know, having that broad field allows you to, to put people in many places, you know, teaching a lot of different science classes. Um, but that, that becomes an interesting hiring process when you, you know, because sometimes you just look for candidates who only have that broad field, you know, and you skip over people who are probably really good teachers who, um, you know, that their state doesn't do it that way. And so, you know, they only have a very narrow endorsement area. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if, what, if there's a solution there or not, but we deal with that one frequently in both science and social studies, um, you know, because those people are at a disadvantage truly when they come from another state and they're only able to teach history or biology or, you know, a very narrow range. So I would agree. Question on that, Michelle. Um, do you find that you have that same issue for high school versus middle school? Because I think middle school is a little bit more broad, but high school is more specific. Am I correct in that? Right, because for middle school, so for instance, our middle school is uh, grade six and six through eight in Kalispell. And so really you can hire somebody with a K-8 elementary license who you can put anywhere, right? Um, sometimes people with that secondary licensure with a 512 get hired. Um, probably more often at seventh and eighth grade than sixth grade. Um, but, you know, again, they're a little bit more limited. And so, yeah, I would say it's definitely a high school challenge, um, you know, because of the K-8 piece, because of that elementary license that often fits in really well. And that's, you know, a, a middle school principals like that K-8 uh, flexibility with being able to put people in different places. And as well with that, because the middle school um, endorsement is what we have at Western, but it's an interesting one because I, I dealt with this as I was a teacher in Idaho first and then I moved to Wyoming. And so as I sent in my exact same stuff to them as a math teacher, they sent me back two separate licenses one for high school and one for middle school. And being able to know that ahead of time, I would have been less surprised. Um, and so I guess some of that crosswalking, especially in middle school endorsements, 
um, with other states that have them like Wyoming, but we don't. And I, I totally, agree. I love that we have that. Our middle school here in town has one secondary trained math teacher and a K-8 secondary, or, or sorry, K-8 trained. And they work so well together and they meet all the needs of students. And so that flexibility actually is really good for us. But knowing that other states are less flexible <laughs> might be helpful in a, a crosswalk. Right, and it gets challenging. So if you're a middle school and you're trying to teach advanced math, that's tough to, you know, a K-8, it's hard to find a K-8 person that is comfortable teaching algebra one, that, you know, you just can't find those. So I guess if the two of you had a magic wand and you could quickly change the rules, what, what seems like a potential solution? Should Montana narrow or offer more narrower endorsements or should they be more flexible? What? I would say we're currently flexible and that's the good thing for us. We need to um, clarify language into the more strict states that we border. I would agree. Okay. Because we are getting, you know, if you just think about the candidate pool, right, we need those out of state candidates, right? It seems like the, there aren't high numbers of teaching candidates for us in every area. So, you know, I guess that's one way to think about it, right? Is that we need good people, good teachers here in Montana and we can't really afford to shut the doors, you know, or make it really hard on people from neighboring states or other states. Thank you. Tim, I see your hands up. Yeah, uh, so I'm one of those broad field science guys when I moved from Idaho in 1992. Um, and I, I think the flexibility of it is, is great, but I, I think the key is it allowing administrators to find their strengths. You know, I'm more of the physical science side because I was an engineering student for, for three years before I saw the light. Uh, you know, for me to teach biology would be, a, a, be uncomfortable. I could do it. Um, but, you know, the physics and the, the chemistry are are things that uh, I have more versed in and, and comfortable with. I taught physics, uh, you know, for a decade. Um, so I think the, the flexibility is good, but like some of the panelists have talked about, uh, you know, we, we need that pool, but also administrators have the ability to, to look at the, the background. You look at my transcript, you see it full of, uh, you know, physics types of courses from engineering and chemistry. Uh, you know, compared to the minimal biology, you know, I'm an administrator, I'm going to look at that and say, you know, this person's strength is right here. Uh, if we're going to hire them, we got to place them in those positions. And so, you know, I, I think that's key, uh, because, you know, the, the pool is dwindling, as you saw, <laughs> it's been a, a tough year. Uh, I, I don't even look at the job postings anymore. And I'm fortunate that I, I don't have to, uh, uh, you know, this year, but um, allowing flexibility is still a huge issue. Tim, can I ask a question for your insight? As you are more catered toward one side or the other, if we um, you know, say we hired you for your strength, but then the opening happened for your weakness, um, still sitting under the broad field science, how would you feel to be able to be forced to teach that because you have the broad field science, but really not the personal expertise in that. Should we, um, I guess, more specify um, what we need to in a in broad field science to say you are specifically biology and then you can teach in there, but you'd wanna go ahead and take classes? No, I, I, I'm fine with that as a professional. I'm gonna work to make that better biology teacher in that role. Uh, you know, I have two staff members now that are pure biology mm -hmm. and we uh, provide um, services to a treatment facility here in town. So the 24 seven uh, facility sends staff there. Uh, because of that, uh, for a couple of years, I had to go and do the science component out there one period. 
my board allowed me to do that. And you're talking about students nine through 12, anywhere from earth science, physical science, all over physics. And so, you know, I was able, we used an online software, but you know, I was able to, uh, you know, do fine with the biology, but I couldn't send those teachers out there because they are not certified in those other subject areas. You know, they're strictly uh, biology. So, you know, it's a professional question. I mean, uh, it's no different than the eighth grade with the algebra one, you know, if they're exchanged with, they're going to reach out to peers if they try to get some professional development or whatever it happens to be. I, mean, I had that early in my career, you know, the principal saying, I, I like what you do, you're going to teach me calculus. Oh, really? You know, and so I went to institutes. I, you know, worked at it and, and you know, taught everything from the algebra through AP calculus and you know, it's just a professional question. I mean, uh, the broad field allows the, you know, the flexibility. You're going to have strengths and weaknesses. You're just going to have to, you know, hope that you can provide, administrators provide support, you know, to help with those. And, you know, maybe it's a one-year fix. And somebody else comes in and you get them in. I mean, like I said a few minutes ago, it can be picky looking at uh, what education is dealing with now. It's kind of to uh, keep uh, people, number one, in education or to, uh, you know, get people into programs. Okay. Okay, Michelle, is your hand up still? Nope, nope, nope. Okay. you got me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is good. Thank you all um, for this, uh, for these observations and uh, experience you have around endorsements specifically. Uh, we can definitely make sure that the task force subcommittee taking a look at endorsements is aware of these if they are not already. Um, Someone, uh, Julie Murgle from OPI was with the task force meeting last Thursday and she, she kind of called out this uh, broad field versus narrow endorsement issue as well. So I think it's something that OPI, not only have you experienced it, but OPI experiences it quite a bit as well. So um, there definitely may be some opportunity around some refinements there and the task force will see if there's anything that could be done within ARM to address some at least some of that um okay so as as you look at this table similar to what michelle and tim and shay were sharing with us are there other experiences any of you have had around reciprocity or challenges hiring a candidate you wanted to hire because an out-of-state or an in-state applicant um, that you really wanted to hire but couldn't because of some licensure hang-up that might relate to any of, of these? Or additional items. We can, we can certainly add to this list as well. Um, okay, so I'm seeing, now I'm not sure, Tim, Michelle, and Christine, if, you, if your hands were left up or if you'd like to speak. Um, Chris, Christy? Would you like to? Sure. Um, thank you. One just quick comment on the endorsement thing. I think Montana should revisit their middle school um, endorsement language. And I think that's what people are somewhat getting at. When, when they made the endorsement language for middle school, in order to qualify for a middle school endorsement, you have to be prepared in every single one of those subject areas. So you have to be prepared language arts social studies, science, and math. So you have to be middle school in all of those. Um, I think that's fairly unique. And it's probably the reason why none of the Montana institutions really jumped on board to do that very quickly, um, because that's a big ask. Um, and as Michelle's pointing out, if our K-8 programs already cover the middle schools, for us to have middle school programs, secondary program, or excuse me, elementary programs, early childhood programs, secondary programs, and now middle school programs that are all inclusive. Um, it's just an interesting conversation. So I think the state should probably relook at that and see if that is a barrier for someone coming in from say Wyoming that has middle school math and then they're not able to come here. I'm not sure if that's happening, but 
that is one of the things when we created in 20 and went into effect in 2015, the middle school is it has to be, they have to be prepared all subjects middle school. Um, and I'm not sure how that aligns with other states. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the things that I've seen kind of, this might be in your assessments column, um, is related to these experienced educators needing the Praxis test. Um, you know, I mean, they've got five, 10, 15. I'm not talking first or second year teachers. I'm talking teachers who have been doing this for 20 years and we're having them go back and take a Praxis test that's supposed to show, do they minimally know their content in their subject areas? I think you're gonna see red flags um, about that in other areas in terms of hiring rather than a test. So it just seems like I'm not sure that we need to be making experienced educators, however we define that, take a praxis test. Okay. And I guess in terms of coursework, sorry, sorry one more thing and then I'll be quiet. Just in terms of that first coursework question that you asked about recency credits, you know, if you don't have a current out-of-state license or if your Montana license expired and you need current credits, um, it's just interesting that we do say six semester credits and I'm coming from an institution, but it's just an interesting language when all of our renewal requirements can be credits or renewal units. So I'm not sure when that credits or renewal units language changed, they didn't then also change the recency credits, but that's another kind of comment for that first column. Okay, yes, and the task force has discussed that a bit. Let me make sure I got that accurately from you. So, um, so, okay, so an endorsement of the idea of looking at the six credits. Yeah, if they're looking at recency credits, um, you know, should they all, should that parallel the, any of the other renewal credit requirements that the state has for licenses? Okay. Yes, and the task force was discussing that, and that's where some ideas that were floated. No, no recommendations yet, but the potential to have people take a series of uh, teacher learning hub courses to fulfill that requirement. Um, there's value if a if a person has a lapsed license. There's a there was a concern that they have recent knowledge of where the field is at, but does that have to be academic coursework or could that be achieved through some other sort of professional development means such as the teacher learning hub? Okay, Tim, your hand is still up. Would you like to add? No, oh, I do. I got to lower it, or you lower it. <laughs> we we can lower it, but I didn't want right. didn't want to use that executive yeah. pow power. Yeah. No, all you yeah, <laughs> unnecessarily. Okay, no Shay. So, um, Shelly, I appreciate the comment about the praxis. My only question is sometimes, especially as we have major changeover in some of the curriculum, and I think specifically about history um, and even some of how we want the sciences taught, things like that. How can we ensure that somebody who might not have any recent experience is up to date with current curriculum? The Praxis is the tool that we've talked about for using that, but I'm just, that's where I'm, what else could we use, I guess, is my question. Well, the praxis is a content test. So in theory, it's not pedagogy. And I could play devil's advocate and argue that there are teachers who have been in the classroom for 20 years who have been teaching for 20 years and are not using current best practices mm -hmm. <laughs> and they maintain their licenses. So Right. And I'm right there with you. And so, because the issue, I, I, that's exactly what I'm thinking. 
what can we do to at least make sure that they know what the current stuff is? Even if they aren't using it, they know. Okay, uh, I see that Noel and Shelly weighed in on the comments and they also uh, endorsed that idea of questioning whether the praxis is necessary for experienced teachers. And I don't, I don't know if you're looking for suggestions or not, but that could be as basic as the class, the people who qualify for a class one professional license don't need the praxis if you're only applying for the standard class two license you do. So there are some more straightforward ways to get around that. I don't think that that's a perfect system either, but the class one would be national board certified or those with a master's degree and at least three years of teaching experience. So that would probably be in our current system, a fairly straightforward way to make that distinction on praxis. Yeah. Well, it just came up in one of our ed meetings about somebody said, oh, we need to get rid of the praxis altogether and said, well, what are we gonna do in place of it? It had no response, you know? And now we've got those PEP standards that help, things like that, but other states have their own personalized tests and things like that, but that's a lot of work that I don't wanna do. Um, so that's why I'm, if anybody had any other ideas or thoughts I wanted to see, because our suggester didn't have any. Right. Okay, any other um, experiences with some of these aspects of reciprocity or others not on this list that you would like to add to the task force's consideration? I have a question regarding Montana and IEFA. Um, mm -hmm. Do I understand Michelle, it correctly? I can't so if hear you're you. an out of state applicant for a teaching license, you have to take uh, something on the Learning Hub, right? Don't you have to take that IEFA basics? Yes. Because I would say that that's probably a pretty big way that Montana differs from other states, right? And, um, you know, I, it seems like that part of it works well. Like I, um, people that I know who've been hired here from other states. Um, find that part to be very informative and you know a good process so whatever that looks like if it's just one course i guess i don't know specifically what it is but that part seems to work well <laughs> so they're all positive in there it's a free like about takes about two hour online Okay, yes, yeah, so and the task force talked about that. That is unique to Montana, um, but it is uh, very important to Montana and um, critical. And, and it's actually in the con state constitution that the education system honor that history. Um, so yeah, so that's probably not something that's gonna change, but the way that it's done, as Michelle said, is, is, is designed to be uh, as, simple and burden free as possible for applicants to complete. So is that a potential model for some of the other requirements? I think maybe there's a question there. Can, can we model how IEFA is handled with some of the other requirements? So I think you said, Eric, that some of these other columns are going to come up later. Mm -hmm. I, I, the special require or recommendation, I'm not sure what REC, for advanced credentials. Mm -hmm. Oh, reciprocity. Oh, reciprocity. Yeah. I just, I don't know if any administrators out there would agree with me, but, you know, I had someone a couple of weeks ago that said, well, I can teach um, college history. Why can't I teach seventh graders? And I said, if you had to ask me that question, I didn't really say this out loud, but
But if you don't know the difference between teaching college kids and teaching seventh graders, there's our first problem. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm a little wary about just like, that's a free pass. Is that a free pass on content? Probably. Is it a free pass on pedagogy? Um, you know, I mean, we've all had very good um, higher ed instructors and we've had some pretty poor higher ed instructors. So I think that component about working with kids is pretty critical. Right. Is there anything that is not in this table that any of you have seen or experienced friction in the licensure process for any of your candidates? Okay. Well, yes, we're not we're not suggesting suggesting that these buckets cover every possible way in which uh, an in-state or an out-of-state candidate might be unnecessarily burdened in their quest to get Montana licensure. Um, but it sounds like we've identified some of the more common ones. And uh, thank you very much for adding. Um, additional nuances and experiences and case studies that the task force can consider. So we will save this and share it with the task force as they meet this week and start and continue the conversation. As I said, we only covered a couple of items last week, but we're happy to um, bring up some of the items that all you all shared today around coursework uh, and then for the groups that haven't presented yet we can pass along your input around assessments the special reciprocity and then also the endorsements the experience one is an interesting um, part for those who completed alternative programs um, you know, when that went through in 2015, Montana did not used to accept um, licensure through alternative programs that were not associated with colleges or universities, either state approved or nationally accredited. And so um, this language that was put in for the alternative programs and those doing those alternative pathways, and this is truly alternative, right? So this is a district based teacher prep program um, not just some change that higher ed has done, not like Western governors, which is competency-based. I would not call that an alternative. It's still a higher ed institution. So truly alternative, like district-based, which in Texas, there are a lot of those. I was just talking mm -hmm. with someone out of Colorado that had a district-based um, teacher prep program. Um, so it was the way to look at how do we know that even though their prep may not have met state standards, they have this experience. So how do we do this? And so that was where that five years of experience came in um, to kind of potentially, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but make up for any gaps that they may have had in their preparation, but they have this experience since that preparation. And so that's where that five years came in. So it, you are correct that it doesn't align with the three years found everywhere else in licensure rule, but that's just a little context for the group as to where that five years came in. Um, now I'm, I'm working with someone, you know, who, who did a district based teacher prep program who only has three years. And so the question now, what do we do with this person, um, because they've been hired and, and that does become a problem. So I'm not providing any solutions or anything. I'm just saying that this is a, a conversation that's good to have at the state level. And are people still comfortable with that five years? Do we want to look at something more like three, um, 
I would be very wary to get rid of it altogether um, because we don't know what those standards of those alternative programs look like. Um, but that's, it'll be an interesting kind of feedback from what the um, task force comes up with to toss back at us to consider. Right, yeah, the Texas model was meant, came up in discussion at the task force also Teach for America. That's another um, alternative that was mentioned. And I think part of that's based on these alternative programs don't, in general, don't necessarily have, um, you know, the research to back up that people going through them stay in the profession for longer than three to five years. Um, and that's ongoing research. And Eric, you probably have more information than I do in that. But, um, but I think that was just part of those initial conversations. So we'll see, you know, now that we've been licensing folks coming in through those alternative programs for seven years, what data does the state have about that? Right. Well, and then the ta someone on the task force mentioned that uh, in Minnesota, uh, like Teach for America, and I realize that's just one example, but they're required to partner with the institutions there. So there is some, there is some level of state uh, of alignment with the state standards there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly something to be cautious with. And it sounds like Michelle is in agreement there. I guess the, the question is, is do we keep a higher number of years of experience, the five years versus the three years? And um, that's what we're grappling with and the task force will have to grapple with. And possible as Christy suggested, possible research. Query. Okay. Okay, well, I know we're, we're bumping up against our end time here. Um, this was a very rich discussion, so thank you all very much for having it with us um, and giving uh, this valuable input for the task force to noodle on and uh, continue to do their work and their research and their discussion. Just to kind of talk a little bit about the timeline moving forward. So... Uh, this is the schedule for the task force. They're meeting again this Thursday, the 29th. And as I said, they're going to continue the conversation around reciprocity. Um, so I, again, your input today is super timely. And then looking out a bit, um, they will continue to meet through August and the specific topics are to be determined. I expect we're going to be on reciprocity for a while, um, possibly through the remainder of the task force sessions. Should they finish that, they may take a look at additional topics that were surfaced. But as there are, as you can see, there as there's many intersecting and overlapping nuances with reciprocity, it's it's very possible that that may take the rest of the task force's time and energy. And whether they come up with general recommendations or specific uh, language for ARM revisions, we'll just have to see. Um, they are uh, enabled to do either, either make a high level recommendation, like you saw with the counselor pathway to say, okay, let's reopen this pathway. But then they can also get, if they get that far, they can also make proposed specific changes to chapter 57. So in terms of this group, all of you, uh, this is your schedule. So we'll have another of these feedback sessions on August 16th. Uh, Tristan, let's just make sure we have the right time, same time as this one. That's correct. Okay, so that's 1030 Mountain. Okay. 
Great. So uh, we'll look forward to reconvening with all of you on that date. Um, in the meantime, feel free to, if there's any, we, we will uh, process these, put these slides up and uh, prepare notes of this session. We will report all of what you shared today to the task force meeting on Thursday. Um, if you have questions or suggestions in the meantime, feel free to share them. Uh, Tristan, should they send them to you? Yeah, you can email me anytime. Um, and I just recopied the Google Sites link uh, for the chapter 57. There's a tab for the feedback groups, and then there's a tab for the task force meetings that include the recording, the minutes, the summary, the presentation, and any materials that we discuss. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's uh, all we have for you. Thank you again for sharing your time and your experience. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you on the 16th convene for this group. Although again, some of you may be on the chapter 58 task force. So we'll make, we may see you sooner, but this group will meet again on August 16th at 1030. Um, thank you for all the good work you do for Montana students. And I hope the, uh, the air quality and the heat situation improves <laughs> for you soon. Hope you get relief from both of those soon. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.